All right, I think we should get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Vela. I'm an events manager at the Memorial Art Gallery, and I work to put together member events like this one tonight for you. So welcome to everyone to our member exclusive webinar on the topic of love gone wrong and all things romance. Our guest presenter tonight is Nancy Norwood, MAG's Curator of European Art. And thanks to your support through membership, we're able to have programs like this one for you online. Before I introduce Nancy, I just wanna mention some of our housekeeping items uh, for your experience today. We do have live captioning. So if you would like to see captions, you can click the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of today's webinar, there will be time to answer questions that you have for Nancy. So be sure to submit those at any point throughout the presentation by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And then finally, at the end of today's webinar, your browser should take you to a short survey about your experience. So let us know what you think and what you'd like to see in the future. It's now my pleasure to introduce Nancy. Nancy Norwood has been the curator of European art at the MAG since June 2000. She holds a bachelor's in Russian and a master's in art history from the University of Texas at Austin, and she continued her doctoral work with a specialization in late medieval sculpture at the University of California, Berkeley. She came to MAG from the Detroit Institute of Arts, where she was a Mellon Curatorial Fellow in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts for two and a half years. Her responsibilities at MAG include the stewardship, installation, and interpretation of the encyclopedic collections we have of ancient, Asian, and European art. She's originated over 20 exhibitions on a wide range of topics, including the late works of Claude Monet, Northern Renaissance prints, Indian miniature painting, Japanese prints, and German expressionism. She has a strong interest in conservation and she spearheaded several long-term initiatives for MAG's textile collections. She employs a variety of interpretive strategies in curatorial work, including the integration of interpretive technology into exhibitions and the permanent collection galleries. Nancy, thank you so much for preparing a presentation for tonight. You're Let's um, talk about our cocktails. What are we drinking tonight? Well, we're drinking champagne with pomegranate juice and a little sprig of mint. Is that what you're drinking? That's what I'm drinking. And if any of you out there are drinking the mocktail version, I hope you're enjoying pomegranate juice with lemonade. So cheers to you, Nancy. Cheers to you, Bella, cheers. and everyone else. And the pomegranate, um, I chose that because the pomegranate, I mean, we all know it's but the palm. Yes, and it's very healthy, but it's also blood red. It has associations with love and death and fertility and agriculture, all things that are going to come up in our talk tonight. So I thought it was, um, you know, it was a compromise with just champagne, happy, sparkly, and then a little bit of dark mixed in because that's really what this talk is about. Well, I'm really excited. I'm going to hop off now and pass the torch to you. And thanks again. Let's learn some juicy art history. You're welcome. So I'm gonna fumble around and share my screen. Okay. So, when Bella asked me to do this talk um, and you know it was gonna be for Valentine's Day, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, the last year has not made me feel very sort of smarkly and lovey-dovey. So I thought, well, what could go wrong with love? So why don't we do it that way? And actually a lot more goes wrong in art and traditional art history with love than goes right. Um, so I just thought that might be a nice way to look at our, our collection, at Mag's collection. Most of the things, well, everything in the um, in this presentation is in Mag's collection, and so, and um, actually, it's all on view. So if you want to go see things in person, please do. After, if you're if anything intrigues you, so. Um, 
I think to start off with, we might, we need to think about what kind of the modern definition of love is. And uh, of course it has to do with, you know, people feeling very strong emotions and connectedness and, um, you know, it goes beyond just liking someone, but it's more nuanced than that. I think we all know, and that usually has to do with behavior. Um, because love can take all forms of behavior that get a little bit twisted um, and are not necessarily that positive, happy, smiley thing. So, and we can't really start off talking about the idea, the notions of love in, especially in Western art, um, without thinking about Venus and Cupid. I mean, Venus is the goddess of love and Cupid is the god, her son is the god of love. And they both cause lots and lots of problems for gods and mortals alike. Um, this is a, sort of a happier painting by Francois Boucher of Venus and Cupid in the early 18th century. Um, and this is kind of the only happy painting we'll see tonight. Um, but I just wanted you to think, you know, to sort of start thinking about Venus and Cupid and how they really permeate so many different um, different things. But where I really want to start is the, um, this is a cabinet that we bought uh, for MAG in 2009. Um, it's the painted scenes on the inside are from Ovid's Metamorphoses, which means transformation. Um, and it's probably a marriage test. It was purchased for someone or by someone on the occasion of their marriage. Um, and I thought this would really be the perfect uh, kind of opening for this. On the outside, you have two scenes. You have the education or the blindfolding of Cupid. Um, and you can, you can see he's got his, you know, he's always marked by his arrows here, or that's his bow, but he's usually carrying around. He's usually this very adorable little winged guy carrying around arrows and a bow that he shoots people with. Um, and that's, and his mother is blindfolding him to try to kind of rein him in. Um, so Venus is, you know, she, she's the goddess of love, but she's also his mother and, and he's very, very mischievous. And he also goes a little farther than maybe he should. So, um, and then on the right, there is a painting that actually is in the Met by Titian, um, that was very famous in the 17th century. And this is, a copy of that on, on the right side here of Venus and Adonis. So, so here you can see this closer, here's the bow. And then um, she's buying, and this is all taken from print, print sources. Um, so these were all very, very popular stories in the 17th century, um, 16th, 17th, and then beyond. But they were really the huge subject matter for artists at the time. Um, there were lots of reasons for that. There was in the in the Renaissance, um, there was this rebirth of humanism and sort of the gaining of, of knowledge of classical mythology um, by a larger public than just, you know, the most highly educated. Um, and a lot of that had to do with prints being made of these um, topics. And uh, so we have this education of Cupid. And then on the right side, you have kind of usually Venus is sort of the object of desire, but in this case, she's actually sort of the victim because um, according to the story, Cupid, he, um, he came a little bit too close with his arrows and went a little deeper into her skin than maybe was warranted. And so it sort of exposed her to the human emotion. So she felt just madly in love with Adonis, who, um, as you can see, is rejecting her advances. So that's sort of a dark side of love. Um, and, you know, it sort of is a twist for her. Um, and this was a, from a series that Titian did um, from the Metamorphoses. But then what's really interesting about this cabinet, I think, are these paintings on the interior and you really can get clues about why um, why it was called why it was probably a marriage test um, it, so you look and there's um, let's see 
there's this little painting up here. So remember that painting, this painting, and then I'll just talk about a few of the ones um, are on the on the outside of these. These are all scenes from um, the Metamorphoses. But the um, on that interior here, you have again Venus and Cupid. In this case, um, Venus is holding a flaming heart. And then the um, the shell is representative of Venus, and he's just a little winged creature. There's nothing crazy going on with this one, but if you but you know that indicates it's a love a love chest, right? But then if you want sort of more um, graphic information about this, then uh, up at the top, remember I said to pay attention to this little thing. You have um, an image of a very graphic image of a rooster covering a hen. So there's the fertility aspect um, that's going on here. And so, you know, that sort of between Venus and Cupid and the rooster and the hen, I think, you know, it's pretty clear, pretty clear that that's what this is all about. Um, and then the, the scenes that are painted, and these are all oil on copper, they're all very small. Um, the way that it would have worked is in the 17th century, this is um, from Antwerp, and they were very well known for their furniture, especially their furniture with painted scenes. But um, because of the guild system, painters could not work uh, on furniture. They couldn't be in the same workshop. So the paintings, these copper plates and the program of paintings, were, the instructions were given to a painter who was commissioned, who then went away and painted them and brought them back. And the cabinet maker would then install them. So this was a pretty common practice in the Antwerp, um, which was the furniture business in 17th century Antwerp was huge. So um, this is representing Europa and the bull. And this is um, one story about Zeus, who um, was known for his trickery um, and he was always transformed. I mean, metamorphosis means transformation. So he was always transforming himself into something else in order to get what he wanted, usually having to do with um, desiring someone that he couldn't have and so trying to trick them to where he got them. That was his big thing was the chase, going back to that sort of bad behavior that we talked about. Um, so in this, he has decide, disguised himself as a bull and he charms Princess Europa with his beauty and tenderness. And then he carries her across the sea to the island of Crete. And I think she's having second thoughts here, staring back to her people as he's swimming across. But he, it, it's all about trickery, all about getting what he wants. We have another scene with Zeus, Zeus and Callisto, where Callisto was um, a nymph and she was um, sworn to Artemis, the goddess Artemis. And like all of Artemis's um, companions, she had taken a vow of chastity. And Zeus tried to um, seduce her and she rebuffed him. And then he took on the form of Artemis, the goddess herself. And so, he uh, he tricked her in and seduced her in that way. So you can kind of get a sense from these little paintings that it's not pure, it's not pure love. There's a lot going on uh, in these scenes that have to do with love, but not are, are not necessarily sort of that um, the pure love that we in the modern world think of. Um, here we have another one where we go back to remembering Cupid's arrow, um, which is very powerful. So this is Apollo. He's on the left um, and he's been struck with one of Cupid's arrows. And that was one thing about Cupid um, was he really played pretty, pretty rough with people. He, he put, played a lot of tricks. Um, he wasn't ever seen as malicious, but mischievous was definitely kind of who he was. And um, so Apollo became totally obsessed with the nymph Daphne on the right. And 
as odd as it looks, it's kind of a, a funny, you have to remember these panels are, the copper panels are very, very small. Um, I mean, this is, they, what you're seeing on the screen is bigger than the actual panel on the cabinet. But so Daphne, um, he, Paulo couldn't stop chasing her. So, you know, we get into that behavior thing, the total obsession. Um, and so he chases her until she's absolutely exhausted. And finally, um, her father, who was the river god, transformed her into a laurel tree. And that's what that is over here. And then another form of obsession, which does not have to do with another person, but with himself, um, is the, the myth of Narcissus. Um, and he's just incredibly vain, like beyond the pale vein. Um, and he fell in love with, sort of as a punishment for that, um, the gods imposed that he fell in love with his own reflection. So he couldn't stop. You know, we think of a lot of times images of Narcissus or um, in a mirror, or whatever, but he's looking at his reflection in this pool of water and he's just worn away by his desire for himself and his obsession with himself. So he finally wastes away and he um, dies from that and becomes the flower, uh, Narcissus. So that's sort of where that legend comes from. But um, so again, you know, it's it's love, but took a kind of a bad a bad turn in his case. And then, um, you know, this is sort of a Romeo and Juliet story, but from the classical age, you know, they those stories repeat themselves over and over um, throughout history. And this is Pyramus and Thisbe, um, and these two lovers who arrange to meet in the woods and um, this bay has fallen asleep. Pyramus thinks she's dead or thinks he's dead, but then he kills himself. Then this wakes up and that's right here. Um, and then she stabs herself so they could die together. So that sounds very familiar, I know, to everyone in terms of um, you know, what happens quite a bit later in the medieval period. So you get a sense of how all of these things fit together. So they're just, they're just sort of little vignettes on this cabinet. And there's, um, I'm going to scroll back to the cabinet. So there's like this door, this cabinet, there's a lock here. So this and all of these doors open, these doors open. And so this would be um, a, the sort of cabinet where you would keep you would keep letters, you would keep um, jewelry maybe, you would keep small things, you would keep mementos. Um, and then you have this special one that, with Venus and Cupid that locks. Um, so, you know, it was very much a luxury ob object. Um, and a lot of times these things, furniture and things like that were given as gifts. But then we, we get into, again, you know, we, we really, when you're looking at all of these things, um, most of what I'm showing you is from, was created from the 15th or from the 16th through the 18th, 19th centuries. And most of it really is based on classical myth, mythology. You know, when, you, when you're sort of, you're not gonna get these highly sexualized scenes um, or stories with Christian. I mean, sometimes they're manipulated um, to reflect that, but usually it's going to be the classical world. So um, Lucretia, the story of Lucretia is um, basically how a tragedy can bring down an entire government, right? So, um, and this was one of the most popular um, myths in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and it was painted over and over and over by, especially in the Northern Renaissance artists, and then um, in Italy as well, this was um, there was a painting by Raphael that then Raimondi, um, the printmaker, created prints after so that it disseminated the image pretty far and wide. Um, so Lucretia was a noble woman in Rome, and she was assaulted by um, the son of the last king of Rome when it was still um, a monarchy. And because of this assault, she committed suicide. So here you see her dagger. And this is a classic, I mean, 
you, you, you can't really see this image, um, you know, as an art historian and not know that it's Lucretia immediately because, um, because of it's gonna be the blade and it's gonna be a partially nude woman. Um, but the families, she was a pretty important member of a pretty important family and um, she and or her families and then other families, other prominent families in Rome got together um, and they created the Republic in Rome. Um, and they got, they ran out the uh, nobility. So this was really the moment that, um, that the monarchy changed into the Roman Republic. So this one act um, and one, the, res the result of one act completely changed the course of history. So it's like in 510 BC or so is where that story comes from. And then the theme of um, sort of love unrequited and desperation and desperate acts, um, you know, it just is all pervasive. So this is an image of um, Dido, who was the queen of Carthage, again, classical, um, looking in the mirror, but it's not really a mirror. You think it's a mirror. Um, of Aeneas who had, he was a great hero and had escaped the fall of Troy. And um, his mother was Venus, of course. And so they fell in love and he, he was in Carthage. And, um, and then he was reminded by the gods that his duty was really to start a new city and a new, to, to found a new city and to found a new um, peoples really. So he, he did his duty and he left Dido and she was devastated and very angry. And she spent all night contemplating um, his portrait, which is what we're seeing here. Um, and then she killed herself with his sword. So it's, uh, you know, yet again, there's that behavior and the results of actions. Another, this is again an obsession um, thing, but this is, uh, this is actually a really wonderful story. Um, this is in the fountain court, this statue, and it's next to a painting called The Sacrifice to Ceres, which I didn't include, but they sort of go together in a lot of ways. Um, so the story is that Proserpina, who is a young woman here being lifted up, is abducted by um, Pluto, the god of the underworld. And um, Proserpina is the daughter of Ceres, who's the goddess of ag agriculture. And so he, Pluto becomes obsessed with her. She's very beautiful. And he takes her down to the underworld. And once Ceres um, realizes that her daughter has gone missing, she begins to mourn. And so the world goes completely dark and barren. Um, there are no flowers, there's no crops, there's nothing. And everybody is suffering from this, including all of the other gods. And so that's when um, they tell Proserpina she can come above ground again and they make Pluto release her. But then Pluto tricks her into eating, guess what? A pomegranate, and pomegranate seeds. Um, which is, you know, the symbol of fertility and everything. And, and there, it has sort of a dark, a dark root. So she winds up sort of the negotiation. She winds up being able to split her side, her, um, her time. So she's underground with Pluto half the year and above ground with her mother Ceres half the year. And that really is how um, ancient Romans explained the birth of the seasons because when she's with her mother, um, everything is warm and vibrant and um, sunny and happy. And when she is in the underworld, everything is cold and frozen um, and not fertile. So that was, that's sort of a, um, I mean, I love these myths that, that explain these really, you know, scientific things that, um, but it, it's all about obsession again, you know, so much of it. Um, 
And then the last sort of super tragic one we have is um, Cleopatra captured by Roman soldiers after the death of Mark Antony. So um, I think most people know this, most of you'll know this story. Um, but Cleopatra was you know, very, very powerful in Egypt and Mark Antony of course was also very powerful and they became lovers and they were just blatant in, in their culture in terms of their carryings on and things. Um, and then politically things went south. Um, Mark and, and Cleopatra was, she was a real kind of mover and shaker on the political front. And she was trying to negotiate with um, other, other royalty in terms of trying to get what she wanted in terms of territory. And so she sent a message to Mark Antony um, that she was dead, that she had killed herself. And Mark Antony then decided that he would kill himself. And when she realized what had happened, she had him brought to her, but he, he died. And then um, she was still trying to negotiate this power play. And then she was realized she was gonna be taken away. So she had slipped some poison. Sometimes it's called an, it's, um, the poison of an asp and um, so she took that and then she died. So it was all, you know, love and lust and power and, um, and you know, military might being brought down by a relationship and by the behaviors that sort of went along with that relationship. And this is a really interesting, it's a little bit of a twist with Rotumnus and Pomona. Um, this is another story that um, is from Ovid's Metamorphoses where Pomona is um, the nymph. She's a nymph who presided over gardens and fruit trees. And um, you can see she's it's set in a landscape. And Rotumnus was the Roman god of orchards. Um, and he became totally besotted with her. And he, um, she also had taken a vow of chastity as nymphs were wont to do. And um, she kept rebuffing him and he kept transforming himself into a fisherman, a peasant. And finally he transformed himself into an old woman. And that's who you see here on the left. And he, um, she, she tried to convince her which I find kind of interesting because she's this elderly woman trying to convince Pomona to, um, you know, not be chased with her. Um, and Pomona rebuffs her. And so Rotumnus decides, you know, that's enough and goes back to his youthful, beautiful, you know, godlike form. And she becomes totally smitten with him and falls in love. So they actually, um, it actually sort of worked in, in a backward sort of way, because she was totally smitten. This is one of my favorite paintings in the museum. Um, like I said, you don't, you know, so much of what we see in Western art is from the classical world and cla classical mythology. Um, but this is an Old Testament story, um, the triumph of Judith. Judith was a woman who was a member of a community who was being a city who was being um, under siege by an Assyrian uh, general, Holofernes. And she went to him um, trying to, to save her community, save her people. Um, she was one of the great heroines of the Jewish faith. And um, she dazzled him and seduced him and got him drunk. And he became totally enamored and so she waited until he fell asleep from drinking too much and then she beheaded him with his own sword, uh, which you know is pretty intense, um, but it was really to save her people. And so then she took his head, which is very tiny in this image. You get lots of different, um, lots of different, this is one of the most, um, 
this was used in the Christian church, like in the 16th, 17th centuries, quite frequently. It was seen as the triumph of good over evil, Judas success. Um, but, you know, pretty much any time you see a powerful woman holding the head of a man with a beard, um, that's what the story is, is Judas with the head of Holofernes. Um, so, in, and it was actually used a lot in um, the Counter-Reformation when um, the, it, she, Judith became, in terms of the Catholic Church, sort of representative of the Catholic Church and the, the triumph of the Catholic Church. So it's interesting how um, these stories over the years were used by um, other religions, other, um, you know, to continue to sort of classical classical myth became um, the sort of emblems of cities and city states and so they you know they these legends carried through um, throughout history and throughout the history of art there this is um I wasn't going to be able to include this in this talk because we just reinstalled it uh, yesterday. And the photography was so bad that nobody could see anything. Um, it was just like a scan from a very old slide. And it's the tapestry has been in storage for quite a while, but we were we put it up in the Renaissance Gallery yesterday. And um, somebody had a lovely iPhone. It took great pictures. So I was thrilled to be able to pop it into this talk because um, it tells the story of uh, it's a 12th century legend, but um, of a 10th century German emperor, Otto III. So here you see, basically here's Otto, Otto's throne and here's Otto seated on his throne. And then he's surrounded by these just amazingly dressed, um, I mean, the tapestry makers in the 16th century loved to show off in terms of their, their brocade and everything. But the reason that this fits in, um, and this is a, one of what you might want to call a judgment tapestry for a uh, justice tapestry. Um, and these were actually very paintings and tapestries and things like that were um, of these various judgments were very common in for um, like town halls and uh, courts, anywhere that was trying to sort of set rules and norms for society. So according to the legend, um, so here you have Otto. Then you have this woman here kneeling um, and she has a crown and that is the Empress. That's his wife, Margaret of Aragon. Um, and Margaret did something that really was not very wise. She, um, she fell in love and became totally besotted with a count in the kingdom and um, the count was happily married and rebuffed her advances. So she went to her husband and said that the count had assaulted her. And so Otto had him put to death. And, um, but the count's wife was this woman here, kneeling, was determined to prove that her husband was innocent. And so she actually underwent a trial by fire um, with her hands where she actually was able to prove through that trial that she was telling the truth and that um, her husband had not assaulted Margaret of Aragon. And so then Otto ordered um, that his wife, Margaret of Aragon, be burned at the stake. And so that was the justice that he handed out. So it's a little bit bloody, um, but it, it sort of goes to show the, the um, the impact of bad behavior, you know, that there are consequences for bad behavior. And then, you know, I think that's on a lot of people's mind right now. And this tapestry is, besides just being an incredibly beautiful thing. Um, so I hope you all will go see it when you can. It'll be up for a bit. And then this is a painting. This is sort of, these are the latest paintings that I'll be showing. Um, from the collection. This is a painting that we bought about five years ago that I just fell in love with. Um, 
and it's by a Czech artist named um, Gabriel Cornelius Ridger von Moss. And he was working in Berlin, in, sorry, in Munich, um, really most of his career. But it depicts a story of um, St. Ludmila. And Ludmila was one of the patron saints of Prague. And um, this, he did this actually when he was only 24 years old. So he was, he was still a student, barely, you know, barely a professional at this point. And um, so Ludmila was married um, to the Duke of Bavaria and her son, Bratislaus, um, she was a very devout Christian and he was very impressed by that. So he decided that she would be the person to raise his two sons. Well, his wife, Dahomia, after um, Bratislav died, his wife was not happy about this because she was going to lose the power. She was not a Christian. And so this was, this is all a martyrdom thing. Um, and so she hired two hitmen to kill Ludmila. And what they did was they, so you can see here, this is her bedchamber. Um, she's kneeling, she's in prayer on a prie-dieu. Um, and they actually strangled, the two hitmen strangled her with her own veil, which is here wrapped around her neck. And the interesting thing about von Max is um, he was quite obsessed with um, Darwinism and any kind of the like mid 19th century, late 19th century spirituality. And uh, he, when from the time he was young, he actually, he was just absolutely fascinated with death and, um, and love. And so when you look at how he painted her, there's, you know, she's so obviously, it's this moment of transition from life to death in terms of just her skin and everything. You just did an extraordinary job with it. So, um, so that was done very early in his career. And then this um, painting of Abelard and Heloise, which he, he so von Max was an interesting person in that um, he was, as I said, he was very interested in Darwinism and uh, he took it so far that he and his wife um, lived with monkeys, a lot of monkeys, and um, he painted them. They were his models and sort of toward the end of his life, that's, those were his primary models were, were the monkeys and he painted them with, you know, holding flowers or um, sometimes he painted them after they had died. And he, he was a very odd person. He also collected shrunken heads and things like that. But anyway, he was a fantastic painter. And um, this is one of his later works. And it tells, it, it's the sad, sad love story of Abelard and Heloise, which is a true story from the Middle Ages, from the 12th century. Um, Abelard, so this would be Abelard here on the left. Um, he was a, a theologian and philosopher in Paris and he fell in love with Heloise, who was much, much younger woman, um, who was his student. And they embarked on this um, just incredible love affair that was, you know, what we classically think of as a tragic love affair. And um, Heloise became pregnant. And because of who they were and their sort of devout natures, they decided that they, um, that they would give the child up and then they would uh, both join religious orders. So, but they kept their writing relation and their letters have been published um, for over 20 years of, of just, you know, lovers correspondence. So this is sort of, if we have one classic love story that's presented in this, in this whole evening, this, this is it. And it's strange that it's in the form of monkeys, but um, but there you have it. But it's just a fantastic painting. And um, it's actually on loan. It doesn't belong to us. Um, when I bought this painting, um, I wrote to this private collector in California who, who buys a lot of Mox paintings. And um, 
you know, just to ask him what he thought. And he very generously offered to lend us one of the monkey paintings. And this was the one I picked. Um, and so, but right now it's not at the gallery, it's on loan to um, an exhibition in Paris and then it will go to Montreal. Um, it's an exhibition on Darwinism. So, but then it'll come back and, and be at the Mag for a while. So it's, if you haven't seen this painting, it's in the 19th century gallery. And it's really, it's really just exquisite as, as odd as it is, it's, it's just so beautifully painted. So that sort of, you know, I just wanted to return to something a little less dark, um, although I'll never think of Venus and Cupid in the same way. Um, but, you know, I, I, we do think of love and Valentine's Day and the whole sort of romantic kind of nature of things, but really it's, um, it's more nuanced than that. So I just thought that this would be a, a sort of nice way to get an idea of some of the stories and some of the art at MAG. Um, so you can come to the museum and look on the second floor and uh, know what the stories are telling. So thank you. Nancy, thank you so much for your presentation. I feel like you covered everything in our collection that shows how love has gone wrong. <laughs> so many great stories. I think what's so interesting to me too is that at face value especially the Cornelius von Max painting that you showed of Heloise and Abelard at face value they're really nice paintings to look at they're beautiful they're nice images that's one of my favorite paintings and I would never know that there's such a sad story behind it um you know and it's just fascinating to me well, you so don't just, want people to get too depressed, you know, <laughs> going through. It's like, oh, God, there's a person being abducted. That person's being killed. That person's being, you know, but but they're pretty interesting. And and I, I really love how um, artists over the centuries have taken those those themes and topics and sort of made them their own. I think it's um, there's a lot of freedom in painting something that is um, a classical myth. You know, you don't have this sort of set iconography that you have in religious painting or landscape or. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we do have some questions from the audience. And if you haven't yet submitted your question, please do. Now's the time. The first question I will bring to you, Nancy, because it's the piece that you started your presentation with from Linda E. It seems odd that a marriage cabinet would have so many scenes of love gone wrong. Why do you think that is? I don't, you know, I think because it's a 17th century and those mythological images were equated with love. And I don't think, you know, the, this whole totally romanticized notion of, you know, hearts and flowers and is really quite modern. And I think that um, part of it is vanity. I mean, people people showed off their knowledge of the classical world. That was seen as something um, that a highly educated person would know. And so you had those things in your house. Um, but I also think that maybe the expectations weren't as high, I don't know. Um, but you, you do get like scenes from um, the metamorphosis illustrating, especially the Venus and Cupid ones. But I mean, I when I first started researching that cabinet, um, and I, I want to say Sydney Greaves, who many people will know, did a lot of work on this cabinet, and I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, she did a lot of the research, but and she identified the prints that the paintings were taken from, which is really great. Um, that's a whole nother talk, but yeah. That's, that's what I think, because I mean, when I think about, you know, you, you get people who are dying, you get people who are, um, yeah, being abducted and being tricked and um, it's not very nice, but yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I, I think I love that you started with that piece and really illustrated the stories behind it because it's a piece that I personally haven't spent enough time 
looking at at the Memorial Art Gallery and there's so much richness behind that that cabinet were also were marriage cabinets were those common at the time well the ebonized cabinets like that were common um i mean i don't say i want to say common like ours if you go through um oh like if if you go to the Rijksmuseum museum in or even even in this country at the met but a lot of the european museums with that really good decorative arts collections i mean you'll see amazing ones that are on stands and every nook and cranny is painted with these fabulous paintings but they're not always marriage tests they're you know sometimes they are scenes of um the trojan war or triumphs or um animals even or plants or you know the sort of people collected scientific um things and they you know it, it was a way of displaying knowledge and culture but i would say our chest is kind of an upper middle class chest as opposed to a but you know royalty had those chests and so the furniture makers um as i think i mentioned in antwerp were um you know world world famous and that was a huge export to business for them so it's a, a really interesting sort of globalization thing too very cool uh another question i like this question uh from judy l in many of these artworks the woman is the victim is that a common theme in european art in general would you say um I think it's until recently it's kind of a common thing in art and in literature and everything else. I mean, you have men um, pulling power, and you know maybe in antiquity and in like pre-Columbian world or something. But because I mean, these are all based on Roman myth, you know, for the most part. Um, I mean, it is interesting that the one. Um, real triumphal story where you have you have sort of the role reversal of seduction and um is is the old testament story but i think it has more to do with um yeah there's a lot of gender stuff in there but i don't think it's just european art i think it's art in general and i think it's the stories you know i don't think i think it's tough to to turn them into um any anything that they're not you know yeah absolutely definitely and i think it all ties back to a lot of patriarchal values that are in a lot of you know histories of countries and all of that as well um a related question from someone else are there any same gender love stories in the art at the mag or in any historical art well i sort of wondered if I'm trying to think. I can't think of anything. I can't think of anyone. Um, at least in the historic collections, you know, I mean, sort of in more contemporary collections as we buy, I mean, you get, you get some pretty interesting, um, like the, we bought a ceramic pot by Grace and Perry, the English ceramist. Um, called the idealized heterosexual couple, um, but uh, Grayson Perry is—he's um, a, a crossdresser and he's married to a woman, um, but he dresses as a woman most of the, some of the time, and he's just an extraordinary human being. But he—he he really does play with a lot of you know kind of these um, questions of sexuality and. Um, and then, you know, some of the other contemporary artists we've collected um, as well. But I, can, I can't think of anything in the historic collections just right off the top of my head. Right. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think we have pieces by artists who might approach queerness and sexuality in their bodies of work, but uh, it's a pretty bold move, especially before current times to really be forward in your artwork and what you're expressing on the canvas. I'm just thinking too of Micheline Thomas 
-hmm. it's something that she tackles in her work but um in a lot of her works I think you need to know about her background you can't just look at the painting and know oh yeah right well and another example of that is Chitra Ganesh whose portfolio of Sultana's Dream I mean she's very active in the LGBTQ community and um and you know it's a very very feminist work incredibly feminist work um I don't know that it's really same sex work though it's telling a different kind of story so yeah and then one last question for you do you think that artists choose their subjects for self-therapeutic reasons um are they themselves maybe suffering from painful love how do they end up on these dark topics well, I think it really varies. I think that um, most of the artists that were creating the works that I showed tonight, um, it wasn't sort of self therapy at all. It was what would sell, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know. <laughs> and I mean, how that story is represented, whether it's represented with, you know, great tragedy, like if you look at the faces, I mean, one of my favorite paintings is the, um, Vertumnus and Pomona, just because the way that that, I mean, he was a, um, Plink was a, a, a student of Rembrandt and, you know, I mean, just the, the sort of wrinkles and character in that old woman's face, which is not an old woman after all. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I kind of like how the question about the gender thing, I mean, it's interesting to me how many of those gods and goddesses flip back and forth between male and female you know, depending on what they needed to do or wanted to do. It's, you know, it's sort of using gender in a, an interesting way. So, um, but no, I don't, I mean, I think that one artist from that period that I, we didn't look at tonight, that maybe would classify in that area would be Rembrandt. I think he, I don't know if it was self-therapy, but he certainly explored you know, questions of his own identity with his self-portraits and things like that. So, um, you know, I think I think that that too is something that has emerged in the more contemporary world. I don't I don't know that artists were really exploring their inner selves at the time. I think that comes out more in um, in poetry and literature than it did and the kind of art we see in museums anyway. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nancy, thank you for such a interesting presentation tonight. I really appreciate all the information and knowledge that you've shared with us. I love hearing stories like this and I had a great time. Um, well, I, had, I had a lot of fun putting it together, so. Good, I love to hear that. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of reminders for our members before we go tonight. We have two things to let you know about. I'm going to share my screen real quick. We will have a exhibition opening celebration virtually for our next upcoming exhibition, the 613 by Archie Rand. So save the date for Saturday, April 24th. Registration will be coming soon. It'll be a really fun event. So I definitely encourage you everyone to try and attend that. And if you're still interested and haven't had the chance yet, member prints are still available for pickup at MAG. It's as a thank you to all of you for being our members. And it's an exclusive commemorative print designed by local artist Delarius. So if you haven't had a chance yet to pick yours up, you can contact our membership office. And here is the phone number and email to do that. So thank you everyone again for attending tonight. And until next time, um, we look forward to having you attend another webinar in the future. Bye everybody, thank you.